Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Tom Peterson, and this is our 14th uh, global online seminar in biodiversity informatics. Um, today we have an introduction to landscape genetics as an a intriguing set of tools in biodiversity research and conservation. Um, and we have Dr. Nico Balkenhol as our, as our speaker. Um, before I introduce Nico, I'll mention to you that our next month's seminar will indeed be the last Thursday of the month. Um, indeed, it will be given by me um, because I'd like to present to you a first nearly complete version of the uh, Biodiversity Informatics training curriculum. So I'll be announcing that shortly. Uh, more important and more immediate, we, I would like to have our usual good set of uh, questions for, for Nico, for our speaker. Um, and, and as always, we're a little challenged by the fact that we are distributed across a bunch of continents for these seminars. So please uh, email your questions to um, for the speaker to this email address. Um, let's see, make it larger. Or if you have my email address, you're welcome to use that also. Um, but email me your questions as soon as you're able so that we're able to um, get answers for you while the, the seminar is actually um, ongoing. Okay, so um, just to give you a brief, very brief introduction to our speaker, uh, Nico received a bachelor's degree in forestry and forest ecology from the University of Göttingen and a master's degree from the University of Vecta. He received his PhD in wildlife resources from the University of Idaho in 2009. In 2011, he became assistant professor back at the University of, of Göttingen, where he's now full professor and head of the new Department of Wildlife Sciences. So as you will see, his research focuses on questions related to connectivity um, in, in biodiversity terms, which he analyzes using tools both from landscape genetics and from movement ecology. So, Nico, I'll turn this over to you, and I'll be back at the end of the seminar to give you any questions that have come in. All right, everybody. Um, I hope everybody can see me and hear me. Uh, thanks, Town, for the nice introduction, and also thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, I think this is a, a great way of reaching a lot of people uh, worldwide. So I'm very happy to be to have this opportunity to talk to you today a little bit about landscape genetics. And I'm especially pleased because it is a biodiversity informatics uh, course or seminar. And as you will see in my talk, at least in the end, I, I think that we need a lot more uh, people with uh, computational strength to help us out in uh, landscape genetics. And maybe as a, as a little disclaimer before I get started, I would also like to point out that because of my training and because of my background, I'm not a geneticist. I'm actually an ecologist and a wildlife ecologist, to be more precise. So this is going to be kind of important as we go through my presentation, um, because I will focus, of course, on landscape genetic aspects uh, that are important to me um, that might not be important to, to other landscape geneticists. So I'm going to try to sh uh, share my screen with you right now so that I can start with my presentation. It worked a few minutes ago, so I'm hoping it also works now. So you, you should be able to, to see the first slide right now. As Tom okay. said, I would like to give you today a little introduction to landscape genetics. And that is, of course, quite challenging um, because I don't know everybody's background. I don't know whether you know anything about genetics or landscape ecology. And the field really is quite interdisciplinary already. So what I thought I'd do is I would like to spend quite a bit of time uh, of some background information that I think is just necessary to understand landscape genetics. 
and to also give you at least one motivational example of why it might be interesting to look at genetic data in a landscape context to understand biodiversity and um, to use it for applied conservation. And after that, I'm going to give you uh, an introduction to the three analytical steps that are always necessary in a landscape genetic study. And I'm going to conclude with some remaining challenges and also with some um, future opportunities that I see for the field and maybe also for you guys. So let's start with the uh, background and motivation. So as you probably all know, landscape genetics is this combination of population genetics and landscape ecology. So obviously we need to know a little bit about population genetics. So I'm going to try to keep this very, very brief. I'm sure everybody's aware of the fact that the information for the development and functioning of all living organisms is contained in the DNA. And this DNA is structured in this uh, helix form, which I'm sure you all know either from high school or from university studies. And what we're interested in when we talk about genetic variation are really these four different bases that um, make the, the, the structure happening that are basically the DNA. And we could, of course, in theory, look at the entire DNA of an organism and all of this information, and then we would call that the genome. But in reality, that's quite challenging, um, even though we are moving towards it. So what we often do is rather we sample this genome, so this whole helix, we sample it in different locations, which we call loci. So we target different physical locations along this helix structure, and we do this using different genetic markers or primers. So it's basically a sample of the genome that we're working with. And the variation that we see in the DNA is caused by multiple different factors. First of all, in sexually reproducing in species, um, the DNA is always a mix of the parent's DNA. So that already leads to variation among individuals. In addition to that, genetic variation is influenced by four main processes. And they are, first of all, mutation. Mutation basically just means there are random changes in the DNA. Mutation rates are usually very, very low. So oftentimes we just neglect them um, and don't really focus on them in landscape genetics. Much more important for us is the second process uh, affecting genetic variation, and that is gene flow. So the exchange of genes among populations. And gene flow makes populations genetically more similar. So if you have two populations that exchange a lot of genes, then they will genetically become very similar. In contrast, if you have two populations with no gene flow or very limited gene flow, then they will become genetically dissimilar. And kind of the antagonist player uh, to gene flow is called drift. And these are genetic changes due to sampling effects. So if you imagine you have to draw genes from a very large population, then sampling effects are probably not that important. But if you have very small populations, then exactly which individuals are able to reproduce might matter quite a lot. So that's why this drift is related to population size, or more precisely, what geneticists call effective population size. Um, I cannot really go into this right now, but in essence, large populations will generally experience weak drift, while small populations experience stronger drift. And if in the absence of gene flow, that means that larger populations will over time without gene flow become a little bit differentiated due to drift, but not a whole lot. Whereas small populations will really uh, drift apart because of these sampling effects and hence the name drift. Now, the fourth main uh, process influencing genetic variation is selection. And these are changes um, in the DNA or in the genetic variation due to fitness impacts. So if you have certain genes, you are more fit than individuals without these genes. And uh, this selection could directly be related to environmental heterogeneity. For example, assume that you have two color morphs in mice. Um, one is kind of sandy colored, the other one is kind of darker, grayish. So of course, the sandy colored individuals have a fitness advantage in sandy environments like beach because they have better camouflage, so they are um, not as easily detected by predators. And vice versa, the gray individuals are probably more adapted. They have a fitness advantage 
in darker environments. So genetically, this means that more individuals of the sandy color will be able to pass on their genes to the next generations if they live on the beach, whereas the dark color genes should be favored and should be passed on to the next generation more in darker environments. Now, it's kind of important to realize that gene flow and drift are not directly affected by the landscape. So gene flow and drift are affected by different ecological processes, for example, the movement of individuals among populations um, and the effects of that on local population size. And these processes can be influenced by the landscape, and that means there can be an indirect link between gene flow, drift, and landscape um, characteristics. And it's a little bit different with selection because here we can have this direct fitness impact of landscape properties um, on the genetic variation. And this is also important because there are at least two different data types, uh, genetic data types that are used in landscape genetics. First of all, we can use neutral data. So these are genes or loci that are not under selection. So they are only influenced by gene flow and drift. And in contrast to that, we can also work with adaptive genetic data, which means these are genes or loci that are under direct selection somehow. Regardless of whether we quantify neutral or adaptive genetic variation, we can quantify two different components of genetic variation. First of all, genetic diversity, and this means uh, the amount of genetic variation, so how much genetic variation is there. And the other component is genetic structure, which refers to the distribution of this genetic variation in space. So if you're more familiar with other types of biodiversity, you can kind of think of genetic diversity as alpha diversity and genetic structure as beta diversity. Now, looking at genetic variation is in itself already very important. As you all know, I'm pretty sure uh, there are different levels of biodiversity that we can distinguish. For example, the variety and functioning of ecosystems species diversity and also genetic variation. And it's important to realize that without variation in the genetics, we would not have um, the other diversity levels. So without genetic variation, we wouldn't see this diversity of life on planet Earth. So it's already important to understand genetic variation in itself, but um, I would like to give you one motivation and example showing that genetic data can also be really useful for understanding, for example, effects um, on species diversity. So this is a study from my postdoc um, where we worked together with some Brazilian collaborators and we had a very interesting study area in the Mata Atlantica, the Brazilian coastal forest. It's a global biodiversity hotspot, has been reduced tremendously in the last uh, 100 years or so. And uh, about 70% of the Brazilian population lives in this coastal area. So it really um, is experiencing a lot of um, human pressures. And in this landscape, our Brazilian collaborators, Renata Padini and colleagues, were able to sample small, uh, small mammals in four different study landscapes. Uh, each of these landscapes is about 10,000 hectares large. And they were very similar in terms of environment and uh, history and things like that, but they differed tremendously in terms of remaining forest. So in one area, only about 11% of forests were remaining. And um, in the other case, we had, for example, an almost continuous reserve with 86% um, habitat remaining. And by habitat, in this case, I mean native uh, rainforest. So um, Renata Padini and her team sampled all kinds of small mammals, and we then chose one focal uh, species for our genetic studies. And we focused on the gray slender mouse opossum, a small uh, marsupial. It's a forest specialist, and it is very sensitive to habitat loss. And of this uh, species, we sampled 529 individuals, which we analyzed using 12 microsatellites. So these are genetic markers that are supposed to be neutral, so not under selection, and they allow us to assess genetic variation at a very fine spatial and temporal scale. 
We were able to get individuals from all of these uh, landscapes, except in the 11% landscape, so the most deep forested landscape, we did not have any captures of the species, even though there was a similar trapping effort. And this will actually become important um, in a minute. So what we then did, first of all, we compared in these three landscapes where we actually had genetic data for the species, we compared genetic diversity. So the amount of genetic variation. You can see here on this graph, allelic richness, that's a measure of genetic diversity. And you can kind of see that the almost continuous reserve with 86% habitat and the 49% landscape had quite similar amounts of genetic diversity. They were not statistically uh, or significantly different, but the 31% landscape already showed a marked drop in genetic diversity. So these landscapes are apparently not the same in terms of genetic diversity and forestation seems to have a pretty big impact on diversity. Uh, the signal was even stronger when we looked at genetic structure, so the distribution of uh, genetic variation among sampling locations. And here the y-axis is um, a measure of genetic differentiation that we use, so the higher this gets, the more dissimilar populations are, or the less gene flow there must be. And as you can see, the 86% landscape has low levels of genetic differentiation indicate, indicating high levels of gene flow, whereas the other two landscapes show significantly more pronounced genetic structure indicating uh, less gene flow and a higher impact of genetic drift. So this is now quite interesting to compare um, to the results of Renata Padini and colleagues because they actually sampled, as I said, 39 small mammal species, so all the small mammal species they could find in these, in these areas. And they found that neither species richness nor the abundance of different species differed between the 86, 49 and 31 percent landscapes but they saw a rapid decline uh, when they went to the 11% landscape. So here there are fewer species and those species that are found there show lower abundances. And they said this is a threshold effect and it's actually a regime shift. So, so the ecosystem in the 11% landscape is completely different now and it's probably not reversible anymore to get to the biodiversity and ecosystem level um, that, they had, that they saw there before. So what we're dealing with here is an extinction threshold. Remember that we were not able to sample our focal species, the gray slender mouse opossum, in the 11% landscape. It's already extinct there. And this threshold effect somewhere below 30% habitat has also been suggested by simulation studies and by an empirical meta review. Um, so this seems to really be a nonlinear response to fragmentation that eventually leads to extinction. And now it's interesting to compare these results and this threshold for the species pool, um, where the threshold occurred somewhere below 49%, I'm sorry, somewhere below 31% habitat, and compare that to the threshold in the genetic connectivity for the indicator species. So here we kind of saw this uh, pronounced different, which potentially could be a threshold effect uh, already after between 86% habitat and 49%. Habitat. So what this means is that the genetic data is apparently even more sensitive to habitat fragmentation than species richness. And this actually makes a lot of sense because as habitat becomes fragmented, um, gene flow might be affected right away. Individuals might not be able to reach all patches anymore, but they are not extinct yet from the landscape. So this is quite relevant from a conservation standpoint, because if we think about um, biodiversity uh, in relation to habitat loss, we don't want to invest our limited conservation resources in um, landscapes that chill, still show high biodiversity. Uh, we also don't want to invest it in landscapes that have already experienced a great biodiversity loss and that cannot be um, protected anymore, so we probably want to focus on what our Brazilian collaborators call the window of opportunity, somewhere around this threshold effect, this nonlinear response to habitat loss, and genetic data might be able to help us to detect this, to, so to understand, okay, something is going on in this landscape and we need to do something uh, 
in order to prevent actual species loss. Now, in addition to these analysis, we also did a more explicit analysis of the exact effects of the landscape um, characteristics or of the patch characteristics. Um, I can't really go into any details, but we basically compared different models to find out, okay, how can we best explain genetic connectivity of these patches, of the remaining patches? And in the most fragmented landscape, we found that the connectivity of a patch depends on how far away it is from other patches and how large these patches are. And that actually makes a lot of sense. A few years uh, after we sampled this genetic data, Thomas Pütka um, did a little tracking study where he looked at the movement of the species of Marmosops and Canos uh, away from the forest patches. And it turns out that they just basically randomly choose a direction and start walking into the non-habitat. And if patches around the their natal patch is large enough and it's close enough then they will find it and will survive but if these patches are too small um, and too far away then they will eventually die in this non-habitat so the results actually genet that we saw genetically make a lot of sense okay so the take-home message of this motivational example is first of all genetics can respond to landscape changes quite quickly quicker than we would uh, see in species richness and genetics can also help us understand the exact way the landscape is influencing connectivity or gene flow which of course is important to then understand where we might have to restore native habitat or where we might need uh, corridors to enhance connectivity in this Example in Brazil, we were able to work with a pretty simple model of a landscape where we only distinguished habitat from non-habitat. But of course, other landscapes are much more complex and depending on the species you're working with, this habitat, non-habitat model might not work. And this basically brings me to the second aspect of landscape genetics because it's not only genetics, it's also landscape ecology. And um, I want to focus on really just uh, one aspect here, and that refers to the different models that we can use to basically put a real landscape into our computer so that we can actually quantify it. And the traditional way of doing that is simply to distinguish habitat from non-habitat. And sometimes we also distinguish corridors here. So these are similar to habitat, but more narrow, and they are connecting habitat patches. Now, in recent years, we've come to realize that this non-habitat is actually not homogenous. It varies in quality and in the resistance to movement, for example. So we now call this the landscape matrix, and um, we try to understand its effect on connectivity among habitat. And indeed, we are more and more moving away from the definition of habitat, because for some species, it's really hard to say what is habitat and what is not. So instead, we just use the gradient concept of landscape ecology, um, where we really just describe the whole landscape as a gradient of different characteristics, different qualities. What's important now is that regardless of what model we use to try and quantify um, the landscape structure, there is a difference between what we can readily quantify just based on the pattern and what we might need for conservation. So imagine two landscapes. And in the left one, you have a lot of linear features like roads, for example, that are fragmenting this landscape, whereas in the right landscape, you only have um, maybe one uh, linear feature. And furthermore, maybe um, in the left landscape, there's a very big road bisecting this, this area and this one linear features in the other landscape is actually just a small path, maybe a bike path or something. So if we just looked at this, or if we were to quantify the structure here, we would come to the conclusion that the left landscape is more fragmented and the right one is less fragmented. But of course, from a species perspective, in the left, we might be dealing with a species that is very mobile and is very fast, so it can easily move even across the, the large road. Whereas maybe this bike path in the right landscape is already an issue for, uh, for example, a snake species. So what that means is that the structural connectivity that we can readily quantify in the computer is not necessarily equal to the functional connectivity, which refers to the species specific um, level of fragmentation or level of connectivity. 
And this is why this combination of landscape ecology and genetics is becoming so interesting right now, because landscape connectivity, functional landscape connectivity can only occur or is on, does only exist when movement is actually possible among locations, so individuals can move and they can subsequently survive long enough to successfully reproduce. And this combination of movement, survival and reproduction, well, that's gene flow. And that's why we can kind of infer functional landscape connectivity by looking at levels of gene flow and um, resulting genetic structures. So the idea, really the main idea of landscape genetics right now at least, is that by looking at genetic population structure, we can learn something about functional landscape connectivity. Because in functionally well-connected landscapes, we should have a pretty continuous uh, population structure, no big differences among individuals or populations. And in the uh, extreme case, we have a completely disconnected landscape, functionally disconnected, I mean by that, um, where something here is completely bisecting an area which should lead to genetically completely distinct populations. So that's the, the main idea. Question now is how do we actually do this, which brings me to the three analytical steps of landscape genetics. And I think it's easiest to derive these three steps if we look back at some of the actual definitions of landscape genetics. So Rolf Folderegger and Helene Wagner in 2006 said landscape genetics endorses those studies that combine population genetic data, adaptive or neutral, with data on landscape composition and configuration, including matrix quality. So they were pretty specific about the landscape part here. And from that arises one of the analytical steps. We have to somehow quantify the heterogeneity of the landscape. In the original definition by Stephanie Manel, um, the focus was a little bit different. Um, they said landscape genetic aims to provide information about the interaction between landscape features and microevolutionary processes such as gene flow, genetic drift, and selection. So obviously, we somehow have to quantify genetic variation in a way that allows us to draw inferences about the underlying microevolutionary processes. And finally, in 2007, Andrew Storfer and colleagues wrote a very um, great paper about how to put the landscape into landscape genetics. And they said landscape genetics is research that explicitly quantifies the effects of landscape composition, configuration, and matrix quality on gene flow and spatial genetic variation. So this means not only do we have to quantify genetic and landscape patterns, but we also have to statistically link the two patterns to make meaningful inferences. So here they are again, the three analytical steps. And I would like to go through each of these steps now, one by one, and uh, give you more of an idea of, of how we can do this. So let's start with quantifying this landscape heterogeneity. By far the most uh, prominent approach for doing this is through so-called resistance surface modeling. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to develop, develop landscape models that reflect the resistance of the landscape to movement and gene flow. So we basically develop raster maps uh, where each pixel is given a certain cost or a resistance um, that we think or that we hypothesize um, reflects the actual landscape effect on the species. So to understand this, we have to kind of assume or we have to kind of think about, okay, if, if the landscape were completely homogenous, how would we best describe the spatial um, relationship among our samples? So these samples could be populations or individuals. And in a homogenous landscape, the best way to describe the spatial relationship would be a straight line. And we can estimate or calculate these straight lines among our sampling locations which tells us how close are the samples in space. And then we can also calculate a measure of genetic differentiation or uh, genetic distance that tells us how close are these samples genetically. So again, more gene flow would make them more similar genetically, so the distances become smaller. And we can then compare the genetic and these geographic distances statistically. And if there's a significant relationship, we call that an isolation by distance or IBD pattern. It's kind of a classical pattern, and it's often our null model right now in landscape genetics. 
But of course, this might not be a very realistic approach. So assume, for example, this case, two populations A and B, and the individuals, the species that we're looking at, can only move in the green habitat and cannot move through this gray area. So quantifying the spatial relationship through this straight line that reflects isolation by distance is not going to give us very meaningful results. So instead of using straight line distances, we use these so-called effective distances, and they take into account the heterogeneity or the complexity of the landscape. There are different ways of doing that, but regardless of how we do it, we always need these resistance surfaces. So these models that basically reflect our assumptions or hypotheses about how each pixel in the landscape, based on its characteristics, might influence movement and resulting gene flow. So basically what we do, uh, we, we make a lot of these different landscape models, we calculate the effective distances among samples, and then we compare that to the genetic distances to see which of these landscape models best predicts the genetic structure. And I already said there are different ways for calculating these effective distances. The kind of yeah, almost classical approach by now is through so-called least cost path. So again, this example going from, from A to B, individuals would choose this line right here because it is the shortest, least costly way to get from A to B. But this approach um, implicitly assumes that individuals know exactly where they want to go and how to get there. This might not be very realistic for some species in certain landscapes. So an alternative that um, is, has been used quite extensively in landscape genetics is based on circuit theory. It's called isolation by resistance, developed by Brad McRae and Paul Beyer. And here the assumption is that individuals will kind of randomly move through the um, through the landscape, and they have a greater chance of actually going through um, areas where there's a lot of habitat compared to areas where there's very little habitat. So this might be ecologically more feasible, but I think they both have, have merits depending on what landscape and species you're working on. So regardless of how we calculate the effective distances, least cost path or effective resistances, in the end, we basically again do the statistical comparison between these effective distances and the genetic distances. And if there is a statistical relationship, a significant one, then um, we can say, okay, there is a landscape effect on genetic structure. And then we can find, try to find the best landscape model that has the best fit with the genetic data. Okay, I want to illustrate this approach a little bit with um, one of my studies that I did for my doctorate in, in Idaho. It's not published yet, but we're working on it. So this is a sample of 200 wolverines, a very charismatic uh, marten species, a very mobile species. And we were able in the states of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho in Northwestern America, bordering Canada here, we were able to sample 210 individuals and we again used microsatellites, so neutral genetic markers to assess genetic population structure. And this is actually a data set that was previously analyzed by Mark Schwartz and colleagues. And they basically did exactly this approach that I just explained. They calculated effective, sorry, genetic distances among individuals and compared that to effective distances among individuals. And the effective distances were based on a landscape model that basically said, okay, everything with persistent spring snow cover gets a resistance of zero. And uh, areas without this persistent spring snow cover get a resistance of 20. So it's a categorical habitat model. And it turned out that it was uh, explaining the genetic structure quite well. And this is because wolverines depend on persistent spring snow cover for successful denning. And because this persistent spring snow cover predicts their bioclimatic niche. So we wanted to use this data set and include a few more variables to see whether something other than uh, spring snow cover would influence genetic structure. And we also wanted to move a different landscape model, namely rather than distinguishing non-habitat non -habitat and habitat, 
we wanted to um, use this gradient concept of landscape ecology. But this turned out to be a little bit um, challenging because at least back then we knew very little about wolverine dispersal and especially about landscape influences on dispersal. So we really were not sure how to assign these cost or resistance values. So what we did was that we first of all developed very simple rules about the suitability of certain landscape pixels for dispersal. For example, we already knew that snow depth was important and that generally more snow depth or deeper snow meant more uh, or meant better dispersal suitability. So we just rescaled our available data to range from zero to one. This DHS stands for dispersal habitat suitability so that areas without snow have no suitability and the deepest snow has highest suitability. And we did the same with some other variables that we thought would positively influence dispersal in wolverines. So the, um, some vegetative and topographic variables. But there were also some anthropogenic features where we thought the opposite would be true. So that the more roads, the more housing, the worse this habitat is for wolverine dispersal. So we again, we scaled this data. And for elevation, it was a little bit more complicated. Wolverines in this area mostly occur at an elevation of the tree line. So if they move away from that uh, optimal elevation, then the resistance or the dispersal suitability um, gets either higher or lower. <clears throat> so in the end, we had for each of these variables, we had a dispersal suitability model. And to now convert this suitability model into resistances, we use the approach of uh, weighted distances. So basically here on the X axis, we have the dispersal suitability ranging from, Z from one in perfect habitat to zero in absolute non-habitat. And then we um, did three different conversions to relate this suitability to a landscape resistance. And this resistance ranged from 1000, which was our cell size, one square kilometer, to 100,000 in very poor habitats. So this is how, in the end, we got 127 different resistance hypotheses that we then uh, compared uh, in this statistical framework that I showed. So for each model, each of these 127 models, we estimated the effective distances and compared that to the genetic distances. And what we found was that it was really uh, climatic, topographic, and anthropogenic variables that mattered for Wolverine gene flow and resulting genetic structure. And what was quite interesting was that we were able to do this at different scales. So we defined two different scales, the small scale referring to typical Wolverine dispersal distances, and the large scale referring to distances that were among I'm sorry, above um, average dispersal distances. So this is gene flow that can only happen via multiple generations. And what we found was that there were quite some differences among these two scales. So here you can see the different variables that were important. These lines are basically the effect of isolation by distance, so of pure space. And the um, bars here show the percentage of the variable contribution. And at the small scale, you can see that's the blue bars here. Uh, snow depth was really the most important variable. So this um, corroborates the findings of Mike Schwartz and colleagues. But at the large scale, we found something quite different. So this uh, housing density was much more important for explaining long distance gene flow. And also this VRM, which is a measure of terrain ruggedness, was more important than uh, isolation by distance at the large scale. And if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense because a dispersing wolverine will first of all try to stay within its typical habitat. So it will not try to move extensively far if it doesn't have to. And typical wolverine habitat, there are no humans, so no housing, and it's also very rugged terrain. So what matters here is deep snow, which, as I said before, is important for successful denning. It's different when Wolverines actually have to move out of their typical habitat complexes. All of a sudden, they are faced with areas where there are houses that they try to avoid, and also areas that are 
uh, not as rugged as what they are used to, and they also try to avoid these, these flat, non-rugged areas. So what we get in the end is a final resistance model that is supported by the genetic data that combines the different variables and that you can now use, um, for example, for corridor design, because you now know where there's a good chance that Wolverines will move uh, through. And you can also identify priority areas that you think are problematic for Wolverine uh, dispersal, for example, here, uh, and for identifying conflict points. So uh, quite relevant for conservation. And this is increasingly done also to locate where we can put, for example, wildlife bridges or other highway crossing structures. This uh, approach of using genetic distances to estimate genetic population structure works pretty well in relatively continuous populations. But it's a little bit more problematic when we have the situation that we have a, maybe a hierarchical structure where uh, at least certain parts of the landscape are completely um, separated from one another, at least functionally in terms of gene flow. So that brings me to the second analytical step, because in addition to quantifying the landscape heterogeneity, we also have to quantify the genetic variation in some meaningful way. And the traditional approach is by calculating these genetic distances or measures of genetic differentiation, the most commonly known are FST and GST. But these make a lot of assumptions and they have a pretty slow response time to changes. So recently, in the last few years, the so-called clustering methods have been developed. So basically what this means is that you sample individuals across the landscape, you analyze them genetically, and then you assign individuals to their respective source populations based on the genetic data. So in this case, you could distinguish, for example, two populations. Population A has red and light blue, and population B has dark blue and yellow genotypes or a genetic composition. And maybe there's also something in the landscape, this uh, green line here that might explain why you see this, this difference among these two populations. So that's a very effective way of uh, quantifying genetic population structure. And a little bit similar to that are so-called barrier detection methods. Um, so they would be very useful for finding this area where the change is really sharp in the uh, genetic data. So this is uh, another way of showing this. Um, what you do is, as I said, you, you sample the individuals across the landscape and then you first of all let the program determine the number of genetic clusters. We denote that with the letter K and in this case it would be three. So three different subpopulations and we can assign individuals to their source population based on so-called ancestry values. So that's basically the probability that an individual was born in a certain genetic cluster. So for example, this individual one here was clearly born in cluster one. Um, individual two was more or less clearly born in cluster two. But here, for example, individual three is a good example that sometimes we are not so sure. So the highest probability is in cluster three, but the probability that it was born in cluster two or one is not much different. And we try to make use of these clustering methods and especially of these ancestry values uh, in a study that was published last year based on cougars or mountain lions, uh, again in a very similar area to the Wolverines, so in Idaho, um, pretty large study area where we were able to sample 371 individuals. We again used microsatellites to analyze them genetically. And then we did this clustering method. Uh, and first of all, the program suggested that there are two genetically distinguishable mountain lion populations in Idaho. But when we then plotted that geographically based on the ancestry values, we found that, yeah, there is a little bit of a separation here between the green population in the south and the blue population in the north. But it's not an absolute uh, separation because a lot of the green individuals are found in the north and some of the blue individuals are also found in the south. So apparently this is not a complete barrier. There's this so-called uh, Snake River Plain here 
that we assumed was a barrier, but it, it was not at least a complete barrier. And in fact, when we then analyze these two genetic clusters again separately, um, so these clusters A and B, we could further separate them into subclusters. So what we had was a, a pretty complex case of a hierarchical genetic structure. So if you, if you think about this graph again, we were somewhere here. We, we didn't have a continuous population. We also didn't have a completely uh, distinct population structure. We, we had something more complex. And what we did to, to then understand what is, what is causing this was that we used the ancestry values and interpolated that into a genetic surface. Um, and basically the different colors here denote the different population memberships and the darker the color, the more certain we are that an individual at this point would belong to that cluster. You can kind of see that there are some areas here where we are not so sure. And what we did then is that to the surface, we applied one of these barrier detection methods to see whether there's any sharp changes in the genetic composition. And uh, this method is called wombling. And we detected only one small significant boundary. That's this red um, line here. And at first we thought that this was an artifact somehow of sampling, that it wasn't really meaningful. But then we looked into it and it turned out that the I-84, so um, interstate highway is going through here. And right here it connects um, two relatively large cities. So we kind of zoomed into this area and looked at traffic volumes. And it turned out that this only significant barrier we found in this entire study area corresponds almost perfectly with the highest um, traffic volumes in all of Idaho. So that was quite interesting. And it, it shows that um, if you have these really complex structures, then you have to be a little bit creative sometimes um, to actually understand what is, what is going on, what is influencing the genetic structure. And again, this is quite relevant for conservation because overall we can conclude that the roads don't matter. We actually tested for overall road effects in a different way, but there was no, no huge effect. It's really only this local barrier effect because of high traffic volumes and also because of these uh, two cities there. Okay, I, I quickly want to talk about the third analytical step, how we actually statistically link genetic variation to landscape heterogeneity. I already showed you an example here, but more often we have this issue that we're working with these genetic distances and these other distances either geographic distances or effective distances, and we somehow want to compare them. And one of the main challenges is that this data in any one column and any one uh, line or row um, is not independent. So these entries here all belong to population or individual one. And so this basically inflates our N and we cannot use normal statistics. So there's an overwhelming variety of different analytical approaches that people have used to uh, use this kind of data. And actually, um, quite a few years ago now, I did a simulation study to see, okay, under what circumstances do certain methods actually work? And in a nutshell, we found that a lot of these methods will suggest that there are significant landscape genetic relationships when there are actually none. And we also kind of found that the most commonly applied methods, namely simple and partial Mantel tests, are not necessarily used uh, appropriately. So if you use them in the wrong way, then they have extremely high type 1 error rates. And one of the best approaches that we found in this simulation work was actually multiple regression on distance matrices, which is also what I used for the Wolverine study. I have to admit this is, this is a kind of an old study, but um, we still don't really have a single ideal method for, for dealing with landscape genetic data. Um, Mantel tests are still widely used, even though more and more studies actually show that they often don't work quite well. It depends a little bit on how you use them, but I think that these issues with methods um, are actually one of the biggest remaining challenges in landscape genetics. Which brings me to my last section here, and that will be a little bit shorter because I'm also running out of time a little bit. So as I said, the, the methods are really a challenge still in landscape genetics. We, we haven't really found a good solution for dealing with these 
vastly different data types. And I think that's one of the reasons why, despite these very inclusive definitions that I gave you in the beginning for what is landscape genetics, really most of the landscape genetic research up to date focused on finding correlations between estimates of neutral genetic structure and estimates of landscape resistance. And we focus very much on sampling locations. So the focus really is on, on developing and testing methods for getting data, the genetic data, the landscape data, and then for methods for somehow linking these two types of data. So it really is about quantifying patterns right now. And I often wonder, okay, what about the processes underlying these patterns? Because to me, that's actually what we should try to get it. I kind of made this disclaimer in the beginning that I'm an ecologist and a landscape ecologist. So uh, I used to spend quite a bit of time in the field, trapping animals and following them um, with telemetry, for example. So I'm really interested in what does genetics actually tell us about these movements? Um, and, do we still need telemetry? It's pretty invasive to do that. Genetically is much more non-invasive. So that's something I'm really interested in. And um, just last year, Femke, a PhD student of mine, uh, we, we published an opinion paper where we kind of made a plea uh, to please not only consider the resistance of the matrix between sampling location, but also to look at local environmental conditions. And we kind of justified this uh, plea by looking at dispersal. So when you think about individual animals actually dispersing, they first of all emigrate out of a certain population. So they have to make the decision, do I want to leave or do I want to stay? Then they enter the transience phase where they have to decide where will I go and how do I get there? And finally, they have to decide whether they want to stay in a population or move on. So they enter the immigration stage. And we kind of argue that Right now in landscape genetics, we only focus on transience aspects and we kind of are not regarding emigration and immigration. So we focus on the effects of the landscape matrix on successful movements. So what is in between populations? But of course, we know that uh, in a lot of species, density dependent dispersal is a pretty strong impact. So we would expect that maybe Areas with high density send out more individuals than areas with low density. Uh, and when I talk about density, I really mean the number of individuals uh, in relation to carrying capacity. And carrying capacity is something that is related to the local environment. So this pattern that we might see should be dependent on the landscape. And similarly, there is a, a process called naturally induced habitat preferences, which basically means that dispersing individuals are more likely to settle in areas that are similar to what they are used to from their natal habitat. Uh, and if this is the case, then we would expect to see higher levels of gene flow among areas that are uh, environmentally more similar compared to areas that are environmentally dissimilar. And in fact, this is also one of the possible mechanisms for so-called isolation by environment, um, something that Ian Wang and colleagues uh, are proposing um, that is completely independent or at least can be independent from landscape resistance and to me is a, is a very interesting way of looking at um, environmental effects on gene flow and genetic structure. Now one thing that could help um, to disentangle these different processes and make more and help us move more towards the processes is if we were using more adaptive data, so data that is actually under selection. And uh, Holderegger and Wagner gave this very nice example of how this could work with so-called genome scans, um, where you sample a lot of individuals in different landscapes, and then you test whether some of these uh, genetic markers that you looked at are under selection. So there are different ways of doing that. But if you detect this, uh, markers under selection, then you can actually compare them among your different landscapes and see whether the landscape composition and configuration had an influence of what kind of uh, genes you see um, or don't see. So I think that has a huge potential and uh, very important for that are genomic approaches. I told you in the beginning that we're usually only looking at a sample of the genome by looking at these different markers. But with these genomic approaches, it's possible to sample a much 
um, the, the genome at a much higher rate, so we get better estimates um, of what's going on and also have a higher chance of actually detecting genes or markers that are under selection. So this is, in fact, I think something that, that will come and is already being developed. It's called landscape genomics, essentially, and there are some very interesting papers coming out right now. Nevertheless, I would um, argue that even in adaptive landscape genetics or landscape genotics, we really have to make sure that we are not only comparing patterns and that we move towards understanding the underlying processes. Because if we don't understand how patterns emerge, then I'm not really sure how we can uh, conserve certain patterns that we might want, whether it's species diversity or genetic diversity. And for that, we really need interdisciplinary collaborations. It's a very complex field involving uh, many different sub-disciplines. Uh, so it's not possible for a single person to do that. In fact, I don't think it's possible for a single research group to do all of it. And that's uh, why I said in the beginning, I'm very excited to give this talk to a bio, uh, biodiversity informatics audience, because we can definitely use a lot of help for the analytical side um, so that we can maybe uh, focus more on trying to understand the processes. So if you are interested in uh, getting involved in this and first of all, learning more about landscape genetics, I, I want to do two quick advertisements and then I promise I'll be done. First of all, we have a distributed graduate seminar. So it's an online uh, seminar um, that is combined with discussion groups and lab exercises and also student projects was initiated by Helene Wagner and Lizette Waits. And I think this is going to be the fourth time now. The next round starts in January. And um, we actually got several papers out of this as well through the student groups. So if you're interested in joining this, um, then please contact either Helene or Lizette. Um, it's not necessarily for free, but they will be able to, to give you the details for that. And the other thing is that we've been working on a, on a book on this for quite a while. Uh, we have a great group of chapter authors for this. And uh, we haven't decided on the cover design yet, but the book should be out uh, in November this year. Maybe it will be early 2016. But we're really hoping that this will also improve the communication among different experts. So I hope that um, I was able to raise some interest in landscape genetics and hopefully uh, you guys can help us to not drown in all this cool genomic and landscape data that we have and help us to quench our thirst for knowledge. This is the end of uh, Gracelander mouse opossum. It's also the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, well, <clears throat> Nico, thank you very, very much. Um, one of the bad things about this uh, format for giving seminars is that it's essentially impossible to to assemble applause, uh, which you very much deserve. So forgive me and your audience. We would be applauding, but you wouldn't be hearing. Um, to the audience, um, if you have questions, um, please email them to me at your earliest convenience. Trying to find them. There it is. There is the um, email address. Um, so please email us questions for our speaker. Um, <clears throat> I will unshare that. And now back to me. Nico, you may want to unshare your screen as well. Mm -hmm. That way people can, can see you. So as you were talking, um, I'm just going to throw you one question, and then there's an additional question from one of my students here at the University of Kansas. Um, I've, I've worked in kind of geographic genetics off and on through my career. And I'd always perhaps um, avoided questions of habitat fragmentation effects on genetic structure because I'd always imagined that there was a pretty significant lag time uh, 
in the development of those, those um, differences in genetic variation. Am I just dated in that my, my marker thinking is slow and the newer markers are doing much better? Or, or what, what's your thinking about that? Well, I think it's, it's a, a very important aspect to consider. Um, obviously, the markers that we use nowadays are different uh, than what was probably available maybe 10 years ago or so. So they are definitely allowing us to assess changes much quicker. And it's also these methods that, that make it a lot quicker. So if you use the traditional FST values to look at genetic differentiation, then it can take many generations before we see changes. Whereas, for example, with these clustering methods, if you are sampling an individual in one population, but it turns out that genetically it stems from a different population, then you've basically detected a migrant in real time. So um, there are some simulation studies that have looked at it, and it's definitely true that with these modern methods, we can assess changes faster. But I also have to admit that I'm not sure that it always works. So it very much depends on your species, on the effective population size, on how, how big of a landscape influence you have. So the potential, I think, is there, but uh, it's definitely not going to be working all the time. I think sometimes the, the lag response time will be too long. Thanks. Um, a question from a University of Kansas doctoral student who works with me. Her name is Lindsay Campbell. Um, she asks, uh, are any methods available to incorporate an expected lag time of when changes in gene flow resulting from changes in landscape connectivity might be detectable for different organisms and how this factor might be incorporated in the biodiversity conservation. And then she goes on to ask if these lag times can be incorporated into analyses, can we begin to predict more precisely critical time frames for conservation interaction? Yeah, I, I think that that would be great <laughs> if, if uh, we could do that, if we could, you know, take a landscape and ask, okay, there's this species we are worried about, um, how long would it take to actually see a genetic response? When do we have to start worrying? I'm not aware of any um, approaches that do it. What most people do and, and what I've used as well is uh, to look at simulations. So, for example, you might find that there is a, a road going through your study area and you know it's a barrier for, for the species you're working with. But genetically, you, you don't find it. What you can do is you can then do simulations and it might turn out that because of the large population size, even if it's a complete barrier, it would take longer than this road has already existed. And then you can actually estimate, okay, how long would it take uh, for me to detect it? Um, so that's definitely an approach. I think... If you, if you really did it um, for, for many different species, it becomes pretty complex to simulate that. And, you know, with simulations, you always have to make assumptions and simplifications. Uh, but I think it, it would be really worth looking into that to come up with kind of an idea or a better idea, okay, which species are more sensitive and under what circumstances would we actually detect genetic effects? Because I agree that this would be very interesting um, for conservation. In fact, when I, when I showed this example from Brazil, um, where we kind of said it's a threshold response, of course, we only had three landscapes with the genetic data, so I can't really talk about a threshold. So we're actually currently looking at simulations to see whether we really see a threshold, and we're doing that with at least two different types of artificial species, one reflecting low dispersal, but high density, one reflecting low density and um, high dispersal. So we'll see what comes out of it. But well, it's a good idea. Wonderful. Well, Nico, many, many thanks. Um, I don't have additional questions in yet, so I, I won't keep you further into your afternoon. Um, All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. And uh, yeah, feel free to contact me if you want any reprints or have any questions that arise later on. Just uh, email me. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.